Welcome to the Heart Rate Variability Podcast. Each week we talk about heart rate variability and how it can be used to improve your overall health and wellness. Please consider the information in this podcast for your informational use and not medical advice. Please see your medical provider to apply any of the strategies outlined in this episode. Heart Rate Variability Podcast is a production of Optimal LLC and Optimal HRV. Check us out at OptimalHRV.com. Please enjoy the show. All right. So today we have Dr. Lori Wagner with us. So uh, Dr. Lori, I would try to introduce you, but um, but I think you have more doctorates than uh, and, and degrees than most people are even aware exist. So um, so let me have you start with an introduction of yourself uh, and going through some of those degrees that you have. And, um, and take us to how you got to the point that you are today. Okay, well, uh, thank you for having me on. I appreciate that. And um, uh, background, um, started out with the early degrees as far as um, was pre-med for a little bit. Uh, life situations changed that a little bit. So then I backtracked and did a uh, nursing degree and um, did some time in doing critical care um and intensive care and then decided to uh, do anesthesia so um did uh, got my master's in um, science and um sub major anesthesia um, and as a crna went on to complete a doctorate so i have my um doctorate prepared uh, anesthetist and uh, practice for a little over 20 years um doing anesthesia in a uh oh, about 16 years of that uh, no, excuse me, about uh, 13 years of that was at a level one trauma um, and then same day surgery. Um, and then during the course of all of that time, I went on to complete a few other degrees as far as in uh, uh, doctorates in um, integrative functional medicine, natural medicine, traditional naturopathy, um, got some certifications in functional diagnostic nutrition, uh, corporate wellness, uh, tonic herbalism, Along those lines. Okay, in uh, hypnotherapy as well, correct? Is mm -hmm. that hypnotherapy, Reiki? Yeah, I okay. Did, uh, NLP. <laughs> so. <laughs> you didn't leave many stones unturned. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, one little rabbit hole led to another. So. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah. so Lori, I, I always find it so interesting. Um, you know, a lot of people do start in your path where you start with a uh, traditional medicine, right? So you started mm -hmm. in a, you started in pre med, as you said. You went into nursing. Um, you went into anesthesia, right? Uh, and then you started going a different direction. So had you always been more naturally minded or did that evolve from what you were seeing in, uh, with your patients? Um, I would say I started out a little naturally minded only because my mom was born in another country and her mom used to kind of do, um, uh, she was kind of the healer in the, in the South America. So a little bit of the plant medicines there um, with a little bit of background with there, not too much, but I really was much more of the sciences and the, the mainstream medicine and, um, and delve that way. It was more along the lines of when I started seeing patterns of uh, patients and just you keep seeing the same things as um, diseases, disease processes, how it's being treated nobody's really getting better. It's just the, you know, um, uh, blunting of symptoms. And then, you know, I had my own health issues as far as uh, black mold exposure um, for many years that caused a lot of problems. So it's like you find that the mainstream way of doing things wasn't helpful or they were diagnosing you uh, in, wrong. And then that sent you down a bunch of different trails of, you know, testing wrong and, you know, they're not coming up with things. And so you, you start looking for other um, avenues to travel to find out what really is going on. What are root causes? It, well, that is amazing. And that seems to be the, the path that a lot find themselves yes. on um, yeah. when they, when they see exactly like you're saying, um, you know, we're just, all we're doing is covering up symptoms here. 
Uh, you know, we're not actually finding a cause. Uh, no, thank God, obviously, for uh, for the type of medicine that you are doing in a you know in a trauma center, um, very very necessary. Um, and obviously, we want those types of uh, those those options available for all of us uh, in those situations. But something like like mold uh, that is so obscure and um, actually relatively common, um, but I. Uh, but a very rare thing for a, uh, for a typical practitioner to go after. Um, and it's very hard to recognize some of those signs um, and, uh, and put the pieces together. Um, it, so, it's uh, on average about nine years that it gets missed for diagnosis. For, for SIRS in particular, not just mold exposure and the issues with the sequelae with that, um, with true SIRS, the chronic inflammatory response syndrome, which sometimes it's, it's sistered with uh, SIRS SIRS, which is more bacterial based, but you can develop, uh, that's what they're kind of linking to, like the breast implants, the breast implant uh, issues that you have can be um, SIRS, actually, the pattern is the same, Lyme, you can have crossovers with Lyme and SIRS, um, different patterning in the brain as far as the encephalitis that develop, but if you do neuroquant testing with the MRIs, you can see patterns. Really, that is just just fascinating. Um, yeah, and I uh, and to think uh, most people going nine years uh, with being misdiagnosed um, is is very very sad. Um, so uh, so you started marching down a different road. Uh, you started you started finding the functional the functional medicine. You started uh, finding cures for yourself. You see you saw these patterns in your patients, um, and. Uh, and then you wound up in front of me, uh, yes. <laughs> and um, and can you tell us uh, what brought you to the uh, National University of Health Sciences, which is where we met? Um, a couple of reasons. I mean, one, I went to uh, high school down the street, so um, I was familiar with the school. But at the time that I was here, it was mostly chiropractics. Yes. And um, and then my head at that point was mainstream allopathic medicine, so I didn't look too much into that, but know the area, I have family in the area, and now where I'm at in life with what I'm looking for uh, and what I know from the university um, was the right place to be for what I want to continue on doing and how I want to uh, advance my career um, and the path that I want to go as far as longevity, anti-aging, and biohacking. Okay, excellent, excellent. That is uh, that, that is so amazing. Um, and, and we're very grateful to have a mind like yours. Um, you know, uh, having having a, a student like you uh, is is very humbling as an instructor because I because I look mm -hmm. at you and I go I go well this student mm -hmm. has so much that she can teach me. <laughs> so, yeah. I think we all have a lot, you know, even my classmates and some of the ones that are half my age, you know, it's like, I've got something to learn from everybody. And I mean, if I think that you have to come into sciences with that, with that mindset. 100%. We cannot all be masters of everything. Uh, and, <laughs> and thank goodness that we can't. <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, so we have had many conversations mm -hmm. that have, um, uh, that have brought us down the road of talking about vagus nerve, of talking about HRV, um, and uh, and very quickly, uh, I I said we need to have this lady on our podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, so can you tell me about some of your experiences with biofeedback? Some of your experiences with uh, HRV, and it doesn't have to be HRV specifically, um, but uh, but vagus nerve, vagal tone, uh, working those types of things. Uh, most of my background with that is not relative to anesthesia because it's not really utilized so much to, as much as um, when you are monitoring a patient. And, you know, when you're anesthetized anyway, especially talking about general anesthetics or deep, what they call max, the monitored anesthesia care, um, you're, you're blunting sympathetic response. So it's an, it's an attenuated uh, circumstance that you're setting up to not really get true feedback with HRV as far as when you're giving an anesthetic. So it, it, it didn't have a big place when I was practicing um, anesthesia in that regard. So when I started looking into it and, and um, then looking into the biohack uh, aspect of it and what it meant, now I started looking at the devices. So things like, I mean, you've got the external um, 
vagal stimulators that you can, I mean, yes, you have the surgical ones you can implant. That's a whole other topic. But the external ones for people that want to optimize things like um, Sensate or Pulsetto or the uh, Gamma Core, um, those are devices that can be used to um, stimulate vagal tone. And you can do other things like gargling, humming. Um, yeah, there's, there's other things that you can do. But if you want to add a little more uh, oomph to it, adding yes. some of the devices help. Um, monitoring it then becomes another um, concern as far as, uh, you know, because at the time when I was doing it, there weren't the apps. And now you have, um, I think it's a Sweet Beat app is one of the apps that is really good. Um, and, you know, or, or attract some of it. It doesn't have uh, some of the parameters that are so good for looking at um, uh, monitoring. So things like the TV1 and the TV2. So when you're looking at where uh, lactate starts developing, so going from aerobic to anaerobic, where it switches and you're, you're marking HRV to do that. Um, do some of these apps uh, have the, um, what is the R, R, RMSSD? RMSSD, yes. Yeah. So in order to, like it has, that has to be um, standardized with the European um, Society of Cardiologists, their guidelines. So if that is a part of the app and that's the algorithm that's used, it's much more accurate um, for tracking. Uh, so, uh, oh, the um, M-Wave. Uh, so I don't know if you're familiar with the HeartMath yeah. Heart Institute. Yeah. So, yes, I am. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So yeah, they utilize some, yeah, you know, a lot of uh, pro athletes and stuff start looking at this too, or the WHOOP. Um, yes. They, uh, yeah, uh, that, and the um, NCAA is who utilized that for some of their studies. They used it using the, the WHOOP um, to track HRV and then some of the data that they found as far as, I can't remember, it was 45 or 60% um, for being able to prevent uh, injuries that they would have had during the season. See that stuff is just amazing, um, yeah. and and I love hearing that. And actually, uh, I'm not even familiar with that one. I have to uh, mark that down and yeah. and look that one up um, because that's one that we would love to throw out as well. Um, you know, just uh, similar to uh, you know, like the NBA with the aura ring, um, you mm -hmm. know, during the bubble, um, yes. and and all of that. So, um, HRV and whoop, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so yes, that's very much getting into all of our space, uh, and, and with heart math or any of those, have you, have you, uh, have you used any of those with, uh, with patients or is that a, a lot of, you've used a lot of that for yourself? Is that, uh, for myself? Yes. But as far as patients, it's, as I was getting into this, so, um, like, so I'm in, I'm in the mainstream medicine. So the people, you know, I think it's, they had uh, put it at about 80% or so about allopathic healthcare providers are actually seeking alternatives because they're trying to go down the path too and finding out that they're not getting relief from their symptoms. So it's friends and colleagues that are coming to me saying, please help. So then I'll start helping them with certain circumstances they have without diagnosing them, without, you know, going down that path with them. But helping them kind of put things together, finding root causes for them and utilizing some of these tools and things that they're willing to use. Um, like even as far as like the photobiomodulation, the um, violites and, and um, at PEMF, um, whole body vibrational um, therapies and knowing what to look for and what to get as far as um, that's concerned because not whole, um, whole body machines are the same and some of them can actually cause damage. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. And I, and I'm, I am uh, very unfamiliar with all that. I've, mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've heard about it all, but I'm, uh, I'm unfamiliar with the, the grand effects of, of, uh, of all that. So, um, it's, it's triplanar, a uh, power plate in particular, if I'm throwing out a, a brand because they did their research off of, um, it really stemmed from the uh, Russian astronauts and all of the muscle wasting that would happen whenever they were coming back from being in space. So they wanted to circumvent that. And so in order to, what they were looking at as far as um, to optimize that or decrease or slow down the time of the, that wasting, this is where they were coming up with frequency um, modulations and they come up with power plate 
um, with the try. It's not just because a lot of the, the the plates will move in two dimension. There is a specific three dimensional algorithm that's used um, for it to. It's, I think about a 55 or 65 hertz as far as each cell. And you know most cells vibrate at about 45 to 65 if you're healthy. Anytime you're below 20, so somewhere in the 15 even to zero, those are cancerous cells. Those are dangerous cells. Those are sickness cells. So when you are exercising all of your cells at once, you know how do you exercise a kidney cell? How do you you know exercise you know your retina? Um, you do it through the vibrational plate. Oh wow, that is amazing. So, so this is something that um, that they would be doing uh, when they return to uh, like for an astronaut when they return to Earth and, and back. Yeah, and bef and before, sorry, and before. Plus, a lot of the professional athletes were using it because they were finding that you were getting twenty five percent greater gains with putting on muscles. So when you're doing workouts on the power plate while it's activated, that you are you will speed up your time about of uh, uh, muscle development. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm going to have to get a power plate for my basement. <laughs> yeah. We're a little right. But you can get, now they have, you know, when I had gotten mine, it was like the full machines, but now they have just the, the flat plates. Um, so a little more affordable. Okay. Yes. No, I, I have seen those in fitness centers before. I just never, uh, I, I never realized the power behind what they're actually doing. Um, yeah. Okay. Oh, well, well, that's, that's amazing to know. Um, it, so with, with a lot of these therapies, like what, um, what I would use HRV for is tracking progress, right? So, uh, so I would say, regardless of the therapy, right, if we're going to have them do um, a breathing based biofeedback, if we're going to have them use a, a power plate, if we're going to have them use, you know, X, Y, Z, um, what I would do is I would put a patient on, I would have a patient regularly reading their HRV and seeing how that trend changes. And if we're actually getting improvements in health. Um, mm -hmm. both objectively and uh, and symptomatically, um, mm -hmm. or if we're seeing things, you know, decrease. Uh, and that's where we can gauge a program and, uh, and the effectiveness of what we are doing. So, um, so that's, that's a lot of how I apply HRV to these mm -hmm. things. Um, now, uh, now when it comes to the breathing based uh, therapies, yeah. Uh, yeah. I know you're familiar with a lot of those too, right? Yes. Yeah, and um, one of the ones that I find fascinating, I like to lean more towards, because there's, I mean, you can do the box breathing methods and other um, forms of that, but what people miss sometimes is uh, CO2 retention breathing, because everybody is really promoting deep breaths. Not that that's a bad thing, but, but the focus is really on increase your oxygenation. But you actually can hinder certain processes doing that because your body is based off of a CO2 response. And if you kind of think about it, I mean, even though you're sitting with that oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve, there is a window that doesn't move too much, but it's enough where you, or if you're in a slightly acidic condition, your red blood cells are gonna to wanna to give off the oxygen more. And you do that by training. CO2 isn't just a waste. You actually utilize it in the body to make your red cells want to give off more oxygen to the tissues. So there's ladder, there's different techniques for breathing that you can optimize that. Plus CO2, CO2 in the body raised is a vasodilator. So now you're increasing blood circulatory blood flow to the brain. So there's a lot of different ways you can use CO2 breathing um, as opposed to um, the, the deeper breaths, which are always good. You can counterbalance it, but work on both systems in order for you to optimize how your, how your bodies take up, um, the, your tissues take up the oxygen. Yes. Uh, one of our uh, partners here, Ina, would be, uh, would be so happy that you talked about that. Uh, mm -hmm. That is something that she preaches on a lot is, uh, yeah. is the importance of CO2 as a gas uh, and that mm -hmm. it is not just a waste gas. Um, yeah. And, and indeed, uh, when it comes to proper breathing, yes, we, uh, that is the cue, right? That is the cue for our body. Um, so, uh, so yes, CO2 often, saw, uh, often seen as this waste product yes. is actually yeah. more important than, uh, than oxygen in a lot of ways. So, uh, yeah. So, um, so with that breathing, uh, we do, uh, we do a lot with biofeedback, uh, mm -hmm. biofeedback breathing. So HRV biofeedback um, based on your resonance frequency rate. Um, mm -hmm. so that's going to be a particular rate that actually stimulates 
HRV the most while you're uh, while you're doing your breathing uh, exercises. Are you familiar with that, or have you ever used that uh, with the point number system for the rating? Yes. Yes. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Excellent. And yes. that's um actually um you know shameless plug. Our app is the only one on the market that actually does a uh, a resonance frequency assessment um, in app. Uh, and then takes you through all the exercises for HRV biofeedback uh, within within the app um, and some mindfulness exercises and whatnot that you can do within there too. So it's a uh, it's it's very cool. Uh, you know we're very proud of that and uh, and actually um, that's all designed by um, our one founder Ina, um, mm -hmm. who specializes in uh, in that whole area. She actually I'll, I'll keep bragging on her. She literally wrote the textbook on it. Uh, so you know. <laughs> well, I'd, I'd like to um, explore this if I could. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, we can uh, we can hook you up with that because we'd love you yeah. to uh, get on it and try it and yeah. and and see how you can use it too. Um, so, what other forms of biofeedback have you done? Um, oh, let's see, whole body uh, brain entrainment, um, the photobiomodulations, as far as um, are you talking more about the tracking? Uh, yeah. Uh, so yes, if you're if you're using mm -hmm. any kind of um, any kind of feedback from the body, uh, you know, so not mm -hmm. not specifically HRV biofeedback, but uh, but any other form of biofeedback, or have you uh, have you used or no? Uh, and that's fine. <laughs> uh, yes, but most of it is along the lines now of allopathic type um, measurements okay. to look at. Yeah. Um, yeah, is what I'll utilize as far as I'll I'll implement the other um, modulators and then uh, assess it more along that line. Okay. Yeah, and I guess anesthesiology is almost uh, entirely based on that. <laughs> like our monitors. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um. So uh. So above and beyond that, uh, what what do you what is your what is your big plan your big picture? Um, as you move forward with a lot of, uh, with all of this knowledge that you have gained, that you continue to gain? It, it's really implementing these things that, I mean, they all support um, HRV, um, but it's in the bigger picture. So like implementing um, hormetic stressors. So um, any of the, you know, red and near, uh, near infrared type treatments as, as well as cold therapies. So alternating um, those to optimize HRV, utilizing nitric oxide as a means of, um, because when you have low um, nitric oxide levels, then you it blunts parasympathetic response. So um, optimizing that, and of course you can actually have too much. So there's a, there's a sweet spot with that, but there are um, breathing techniques and there's supplements actually that increase um, nitric oxide. So one of my favorites right now is pantadecanoic acid. So I'm, I'm favoring that. Um, let's see. I mean, some of the uh, uh, ashwagandha um, has been helpful. Um, uh, the Going back to the pantadecanoic acid, because also um, it enhances your uh, endocannabinoid system. And that's actually been known to help parasympathetic system. So I don't tend to lean more towards the CBDs, um, but enhancing it in different ways. So that pentadecanoic acid uh, fits the bill for that and mitochondrial function as well. Okay. So, um, so I, I'm sorry, let's, uh, let's go back there. So I, so mm -hmm. when I, when you say going into pan, uh, pantadecanoic acid, um, mm -hmm. right? So, um, so you're saying that is increasing nitric oxide. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, it does. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and systemically, so, yes. Okay. All right. So that's increasing nitric oxide, which in turn is increasing parasympathetics. Um, mm -hmm. and in turn, uh, we would see that, uh, reflect on like HRV or we would see that as vagal tone increasing, um, as parasympathetics do. do rise up. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So that would be, um, that would be, Oh, very cool to see. See, these these are the things I need to uh, I need to just be picking your brain nonstop about. Um, and is this something that you use yourself then? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And actually, the the research on that comes from dolphins. 
And so right. um, in, in the Navy and also from vets that were doing the research on it because they were finding that um, dolphins were aging like humans were. And so they were developing things like fatty livers and also heart rate uh, variability issues. Um, cardiovascular type issue, I mean, um, vascular type issues. And I mean, you start to wonder, because now it gets blamed a lot on in you know, our sad diet, the standard American diet with yeah. the sugars, but you don't have dolphins out there eating the sugars. So why are they developing this situation, especially with their liver? Well, it come, dolphins typically eat a diet of about five different types of um, fish. One of them in particular, is um, that they end up eating more of as they're getting older is very low in the um, pentadecanoic acid. So it's C15, FA15, it's all known as the same thing. It's a odd chain fatty acid um, that, uh, saturated, excuse me, fatty acid that they're finding to fit the parameters of an essential fatty acid, which is um, kind of new within these last 90 years of a, of a new finding for what it fits the parameters for but they're actually seeing how it can reverse um, uh, liver issues, uh, cardiovascular issues. And then it also helps to increase um, heart rate support and heart rate variability. Really? Okay. So this is a <laughs> phenomenal. Um, and one thing that I, I, I have to go back to HRV <laughs> and dolphins. Yeah. Okay. Um, would you have any idea how that was obtained? I, I'm extremely uh, curious about this. <laughs> um, but actually more so that it's, um, they're finding though too that the dolphins in the um, captive were actually now outliving the ones in the wild. Cause you know, mostly they say the ones that are captured um, since they're not in their natural environment will die sooner. They were actually finding that dolphins were living um, longer um, in captivity when they're fed appropriately. So then you're finding that they're getting the better fish sources that have the higher C15 in them. And then they start tracking, but you can actually even their face, their skin, their, all of that was aging in that way as well though too, as well as internally. So they just started doing biomarkers on the dolphins to, uh, to um, tell that, I mean, you can't, um, not look at any type of species without looking at its heart and its function and and how it affects the rest of the system. That is phenomenal. So they uh, so they recognized this uh, this missing fatty acid in a dolphin's diet, and then they started giving to it uh, giving it to them in captivity, and they had these results. Then is that uh, is that correct? Well, they out in the wild the dolphins aren't getting i mean with their mainstay diet they're eating a variety but as they're getting older they're finding more that they're eating the ones that have less of what they're used to eating with the pentadecanoic acid in it the ones in captivity well now i mean they're having to scavenge for that food when they're out in the wild they're not having right. to scavenge when they're in captivity so they're already okay. being given so they're they're getting more of it as opposed to being depleted out in the wild okay okay Man, uh, yeah, no, that's uh, that that's pretty amazing. Uh, <laughs> well, also uh, naked mole rats, not so much with the pentadecanoic acid, but all the studies that they've done with the naked mole rats and um, how their system is. I mean, because they tend to be, they're even though they're mammals, they tend to be poikilothermic, so they um, respond in ways that have been studied quite a bit as far as sympathetic shutdown, reptilian. Uh, um, uh, responses in their in their uh, nuclei nuclei in the brain for which patterns what we're talking about for heart rate variability. Yeah. Okay. Oh, fa fascinating. Um, all right. C and can we uh, jump over to ashwagandha? Um, yeah. So I'm sure most people who are listening have never even heard of ashwagandha. Mm -hmm. um, so can you tell us what ashwagandha is and then how uh, how that is uh, affecting our body? Uh, mm, uh, ashwagandha yeah. is like, kind of like in the Ayurvedic uh, healthcare system that they have. It, it's even though there isn't one thing that you call a panacea, it's almost what they do refer to as a panacea because it kind of covers everything. Yeah. So it, um, it actually helps 
so many in so many different ways, but it actually help increase GABA, which that's another thing that I utilize though too to help because that supports parasympathetic. Yes. Um, so that that's another avenue though too, but it also supporting the HPA axis, um, all of the stress because you know that our biggest adaptability with stress based on the HRV and how our whole autonomic uh, nervous system is responding is relative to to that so ashwagandha helps support that system um helps support your adaptability to stresses helps with sleep um uh, it, it has uh, cardiovascular benefits as well though too vascular health um can help with uh, um blood sugar a cellular response to insulin Oh, wow. So, so this is uh, just an all-around amazing thing to be uh, to be taking. That's um, I, I feel like there's a number of supplements that are just a good idea for us all to be taking all the time, right? Um, well, adaptogenic mushrooms are another category that are great. So things like shaga, reishi, cordyceps. So uh, sorry, I'm trying to jot some of these things down. Um, okay. So when we get into the mushrooms like that, um, this is becoming uh, this, you know, over the, over the last several years, I feel like mushrooms have really been breaking onto the scene um, and, uh, and being recognized for how powerful they are, right? Or probably over the last uh, you know, 10 years or so, um, they've really been making a name for themselves. Um, Here. Yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> Here in the United States, yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm, Everywhere else, they already knew so many yeah. of these secrets already, right? Mm -hmm. um, but when we talk about, you know, different types of mushrooms and their positive health benefits, mm -hmm. um, what, I, how, how does this work for us, right? We, we, are, we are eating something, um, we are eating a, a fungus, uh, which most of us look at a fungus as a, a very negative thing. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, you hear that a mushroom steak has more protein than a regular steak. Uh, so, yeah. Um, yeah. How do I, how does this work with mushrooms? Well, not not all mushrooms are created equal, and most people know mushroom as like um, agaricus, the the white button mushroom, and it's more for your you know in, enhancing whatever you're eating. But things that have actually more alkaloid uh, or more um, uh, more on the medicinal aspect, they're adaptogens. And so those adaptogens are beautiful because they read your body. So like let's say if you have um, in an acute allergy to something, that's typically your IgEs that end up being activated and, and increased. But if you've got low level food type allergies, you've got your IgGs um, that are like slow burners, but all of it is basically an underlying inflammatory response in your body. Uh, one may be more acute and the other a little more chronic, but the beautiful thing about some of these adaptogens, and some of them do different things in different systems, but they basically read you. So if you're running high with some of your markers, they help to balance you and bring you down. If you're running low and tend to get sick and colds and all of that, it tends to raise you. So they, you don't even have to tell it what to do. It knows what to do. It has an, its own innate sense to help you as far as immunologic, but you know, things like um, lion's mane now is really making it its name here for cognitive function. So even That's, mainstream now is putting patients who have under the umbrellas of dementias and recommending things like a lion's mane with something like vinpocetine, um, for example, or um, you know stressing like the omegas, which the omegas actually have omega three in particular helping also heart rate variability. They've done studies on that, but things like plasmalogens and the pentadecanoic acid actually are 10 to 15 times have a, or have a greater benefit than the omega-3s. You get more bang for your buck. Yeah, and, um, it, and correct me if I'm wrong with this. Now, I, I know obviously eating anything fresh is, uh, is best, but I, mm -hmm. but I have heard that with mushrooms, there's a, as far as sustainability, like, uh, mm -hmm. like these things can hang out for a long time, um, storage wise and, uh, and not degrade in their nutritional content. Is that, is that correct? Um, depends on the mushroom. Okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, and yeah, I, I would say it kind of depends on the mushroom. Some of them, okay. I mean, so not always like, the case. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. 
Yeah. yeah. I mean, All you right. can throw, you know, your button mushrooms in the refrigerator and they only last so long. Yeah. They will go bad. Okay. Um, and, uh, it, and maybe that was, uh, you know, dried a certain way or something and that I, uh, I, I have a friend who's very into, um, uh, into his various mushroom mixes. He does a uh, functional nutrition. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, I, he, he dries them all certainly and encapsulates uh, the, some and whatnot too. So that, that may be very different, but. That, well, no, you can do that and that's okay because, you know, it, mushrooms are, you know, their basis is in spores. So they have an ability to lock themselves in and maintain for a long period of time. If you prepare them that way, if you're just talking about keeping them raw, no, but yeah. if you're talking, I mean, um, Ron Teagarden, uh, he has a technology called fit technology, which is, um, fingerprint identification, uh, technology transfer. And it basically amongst all other preparations will actually get it to almost 99% of what the food source is mushrooms in particular, or, or the, the, um, ginsenicides as far as for your gingers or your, um, ginsengs to a 99% availability, which is almost unheard of in other supplementations that you, you know, you'll have like 75%. He can get right. it up to 99%. So, really? Yeah. And that, and that was a FIT technology you said? I'm sorry. It's F-I-T-T. -T. Okay, yeah. F-I-T-T. -T. Okay. Oh, that's pretty amazing. Okay. Um, and mushrooms, another great thing too. Uh, I learned... Oh, probably five years ago, how easy it is to grow them. Yeah. Um, I, and it's actually kind of a fun process. Uh, yeah. You know, I drill into a log and uh, <laughs> yeah. encapsulate it, toss a little food wax over, and then uh, for me, and toss them in the woods behind my house. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, and I don't know if you've read any of the, the uh, works of uh, Paul Stamets, the mycologist. Uh, so I have done. Um, I have heard of him, but I, I can't say I'm super familiar with any of his work. Yeah, um, he's, uh, I mean, he's known as the mushroom hunter. And I've uh, been to a few symposiums that he's talked at. I've spoken with him a few times. He has a wealth of information as far as um, mushrooms and what they can really do. So if, I mean, just somebody to look into if you're, you're interested. And he actually has a, a line out there. Even Whole Foods carries it. Um, uh, Host Defense mm. is the product. Um, Mike, yeah. So, I mean, he's got individualized or blend forms. So he's got the, um, the Rishis, the Shagas, the Maitakis, the Shiatakis, the, yeah. Has it all. all. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, that's pretty amazing. Uh, I'm going to have to look at him and actually I'm, uh, I'm almost positive. That's where I've heard of him is either on a podcast or somebody else recommended that I uh, use some of his products. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and also, uh, for anybody who's never tried it before, um, mm -hmm. cutting a fresh mushroom right off of a log and yeah. eating it is like, it totally changes the way that you look at mushrooms, uh, as far as, uh, the taste and flavors go. Uh, it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's really amazing. Um, but, uh, I wanted to go back to <laughs> cannabinoids. Uh, so you had mentioned the cannabinoid system, um, mm -hmm. and, and then you, uh, began matching, I believe CBD at some point too, but, but let's focus on just the cannabinoid system. So, um, so it, are you familiar enough with, or, or comfortable enough to, uh, to explain how that system works? And because I think a lot of people don't even, uh, don't even understand where we're at with the, with cannabinoids in our body and that that's a natural thing that is within our body already, that our body literally has a system, uh, for that. So, uh, are we talking relative to HRV or um, just in, just in general? Yeah. No. Just in general. Yeah. Um, oh man. Um, and, and sorry, okay. I know that's a really big question. <laughs> I, mean, it, I mean, kind of condensing it down and the cannabinoid system is kind of, I mean, it's interlinked too with your limbic system, okay. um, as, um, as well as your autonomic nervic nervous system. So you get a lot of, um, influence between the two and then also as far as you know vagus nerve uh so you get i mean in vagus nerve you know kind of spreads to everything so now you're talking viscera so you're talking about its effects um in the system for uh 
I mean, it affects mood. It affects your association with mood and, and your um, body response with that. So the connections with that um, endocannabinoid system is kind of like a communicator with that. So how does that work in terms of, and you're the perfect person to ask this, how does that work in terms of gating pain? So um, so people would, I've, I've heard, and I'm sure you've heard of this as well, um, people who, um, who have been on traditional painkillers uh, mm-hmm. and are not getting a response to that will switch over to something like CBD and say, oh my gosh, that was a total game changer. Mm-hmm. Um, how does that work? Uh, well, I mean, the parts of the system that you're you're activating, I mean, you are dealing a little bit with substance P um, in, in that regard, though, too, in the modulation. Um, there actually is a, a cytokine uh, relationship, though, too. So when you're decreasing some of your um, inflammatory markers, um, also helps to modulate pain in, in that regard. There are some people, though, um, where CBD is actually has the opposite effect. So it will actually wire them horribly. Um, so you have to kind of mark the person and actually you can track them with HRV as well to see their their response Indeed. with that. Yeah. Uh, awesome, awesome. And, and thank you for throwing an HRV in there. Uh, <laughs> it, so, uh, so with uh, a CBD type product, uh, as that's you know one of those products that has been getting so much yeah. Uh, fame and recognition all of a sudden, right? Uh, so much commercial interest. Um, there's all the different arguments about, uh, about, do you get full spectrum? Do you get just a CBD? What's a, uh, you know, where do you, where do you purchase it to get quality? All of these things. Um, and I know personally, I've heard, uh, you know, and, and from everything that I've read, full spectrum seems to be the way to go. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I know, uh, you know, I have my brands that that I prefer to send patients uh, to direct patients towards. Mm-hmm. But um, but being that I you're, you're very familiar with these things, uh, what what is your take on all of that? Uh, well, yes, I'm I'm a little mixed with CBD. I mean, there's a lot of different hybrids on yes. the different plants. So your content and your percentages are a little bit different and, you know, weeding out the THC and the CBD and then the concentrations that you put it in with people's response to it. And some of it is actually um, GMO'd. So yes. now you're having a whole other issue though, too, with staying away from some of those just for that you know, issue alone. Um, I, does it help sleep? Does it help, you know, your RAS system? Does it help all of that? It, it can, and it does, of course. Um, but long-term effects is where I think people kind of um, jump the gun with wanting to do all of this too soon. And as far as long, and I think there's ways you can do it. And now they're finding a way of microdosing. And I'd rather see a microdosing aspect of it than um, over a period of time than it to help prime your system than to be giving them some of the higher concentrations um, or what would be considered normal concentrations now with what's in some of the supplements. And actually, and I, I know more people, I, I do lean more towards the uh, natural realm, but LDN, low dose naltrexone, is really something that is showing in, incredible use for so many different things, bypassing CBD and having better effect with um, people with uh, chronic pain issues, Lyme, um, fibromyalgias, autoimmunes, all of that, and the benefit that people are getting from really low dose naltrexone over the CBDs with less complication, I tend to lean towards that. Really? Okay. Um, and, uh, and I'm not a big pusher of the medications, but I'm just saying right. when you need something or when, you know, and again, when you've got somebody that's suffering for a long period of time where they're not finding things and they keep trying things, sometimes you intervene with something to give them a little bit of benefit um, and then just enough to perk them up so that their system can really start healing. Awesome. Yeah, no, I know. I, I really like that. Uh, <laughs> Indeed, got to stimulate the system so it can do what it was meant to do, right? Exactly. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and as we're on the realm of supplements here, um, <laughs> what are some of your other favorite supplements that you uh, that you love? 
Um, so I mentioned a few of them, like the plasmalogens, the uh, FA15. Um, oh, peptides. Love me some peptides. So. Okay. Well, you're going to have to explain <laughs> these things because uh, plasmalogen, uh, <laughs> What, um, what is that? Uh, FA15, what is that? These are, these are fats, but the work comes from Dr. Gooden now. And he started out his research, I think it's a little over three decades. Um, and he has a research lab or an institute. I'm not quite remembering the name off the top of my head, but it started out with Alzheimer's. And um, his but he was finding, especially when you're looking at the markers for, you know, the blood markers and the lipid markers for um, total cholesterols. And I don't know if this is going to be a bad thing to say or if I'm going to get in trouble as far as how we look at those, um, how we label the, um, uh, the whether it's uh, HDL and LDL and one is good and one is bad. They're neither. They serve a purpose in the body at certain levels and you need both of them. Um, just like you need sympathetics and you need parasympathetics in balance. So if yes. you are out of balance with that and you start seeing those, then you have other sequelae that happen um, that you'll, uh, whether it's the heart disease factors, but cholesterol isn't what it is put out there as. And the numbers and the values that they say are bad and to keep it under, are not good either. So I think <laughs> that's a little off. Um, but having said that, that also throws off all of your other ratios and plasmalogens they have found as far as for support, because, you know, Alzheimer's though too, it's really um, purported as far as like it's the amyloid plaques and it's like, but then some people are saying chicken or egg. Is it because it is come up with to, um, to protect your brain that you're developing these plaques. It's not a byproduct of, and it's not, and they're also finding the studies about that. It's not supporting that even people that have some of the plaques or they're taking medications that are decreasing the plaques, that they're still having the symptomatology that's progressing throughout Alzheimer's. So how much is this link really there? So coming at it from a backdoor approach with some of these other fatty acids, um, you're actually finding that it is balancing out your uh, lipid profile and you're altering um, brain in the process though too, whether it's with Parkinson's, whether it's with Alzheimer's. Really? Um, so this can be, um, this can be both preventative and, uh, and used for somebody who is actively in a, in a degeneration state and or that degenerating. Yes, and then throwing back in there, going back to, uh, again, the um, pentadecanoic acid, because the benefit of that is that since it's an odd chain fatty acid, how it penetrates the cell membranes, it doesn't oxidize. So it stays stable. So it strengthens your cell and your cell membrane. So that's how it's also reversing other conditions, because, you know, you're a bunch of cells. You need to, and so yes. a lot of times <laughs> um, people are using things like phosphatidylcholine in order to benefit cell membrane, which is great. And you know, you, you got a lot of fat in your brain too. Um, but some of the things that they're purpo purporting to use aren't necessarily the best. And they also have some side effects that go along with it. Taking the supplement form, because you can find the, um, the C15 in butter and ghee. So but the amount that you would have to eat, you would get a lot of the problems <laughs> in, yeah, uh, and side effects of that for the amount that you need. Taking it in the supplement form for, um, I find, to be the way to um, start reversing some disease processes and restoring things. And the, the stability of this product is amazing. Oh, really? All right. Well, I'm, I'm, you've convinced me. I'm going to order some. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I... Uh, so uh, another thing I wanted to say with the cholesterol, um, no, you are uh, you are in good company. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so no, that is uh, that is not a thing at all. Um, yeah, I, and I am one hundred percent on board with you on uh, on that. You know, our, our body produces everything for a reason, right? We, uh, we there's a reason why we have all of these things. It's uh, you know, it's what we choose to do to our bodies that uh, that maybe sets the stage for a, a negative outcome. And, um, and yes, the numbers might be a little tilted to uh, help certain industries, possibly. 
<laughs> you said it better than I did. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, so, so then you had mentioned a FA-15? Uh, FA-15, the, the C-15, that's the pentadecanoic acid, all the same thing. But oh, okay, other people okay. know it as different things. Okay. So, so yeah. all... if they're researching it or if they're looking into it, I'm just throwing out the names. Okay. All right. And it's written C15 colon zero. Okay. All right, excellent. Yeah, these are uh, these are some interesting things that I have to have to go and check out. So, um, so say for a general person, uh, you know, your your average person who just wants to be on some some good supplements, right? I. Uh, I, I get the question all the time, what's a good multivitamin for me to be on? And then I say, ah, I don't know if there really is one. <laughs> there is one. So what what would you recommend? Um, there is a product that I really do like. It also comes from um, Earth Minerals, um, but it's it's liquid form. And the company is, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm giving out a lot of plugs here. And I don't know if I Oh, no, be. you're, um, you're, you're Beam, fine. Beam Minerals has okay. got, they have got a mineral liquid form and they have a electrolyte and the combination of the two, because that was the other thing I was going to say in order to also optimize heart rate var variability and autonomic nervous system function. It's the micro um, minerals that we're finding that where people don't even realize the depletion that they have in their system. So, I mean, if, whether it's molybdenum or, you know, even the, the, the finer ones, how people have things off as far as, you know, or taking zinc supplements, how much they don't know it throws off copper. And even though copper yeah. is very, there's a narrow window for it, but even the slightest amount of being low can give off a lot of different symptoms that people don't realize, but supporting it through um, fulvic acid, zeolites um, in that form. So Be Beam has got both of those. And I find, and if, if you want to just take something that, all right, baseline, just to get you, all right, I'm going to give myself something that at least going to start giving back some and rebalancing some of my depletions. I would do that. And it's in the liquid form. You've got better bioavailability as well. Oh, okay. Very interesting. So, so it's uh, crazy that you brought that up. I was just, <laughs> I, are you familiar with Dr. Rachel Fabi? Um, I'm not she's, sure. She's actually, uh, she, she has a, she has, many a degrees as well, but she's actually um, a uh, obtaining another degree at the school. So I think she might be in some of the M ND classes alongside you for some of these too. Um, but uh, but she, uh, she was just talking to me about uh, uh, Dr. Luis Edwards. I was just trying to pull it up. And she is a specialist in all of the different uh, bone salts and all of that. Uh, yeah. So she was she was talking to me about all of these things that you were just uh, mentioning. How how <laughs> funny is that? Uh, yeah. So so yeah. So apparently I was meant to hear these things. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm gonna actually look at that. Uh, so um, there's also possible. another product that I wouldn't necessarily. I mean, especially people with allergies. But um, uh, Quinton has a um, 0.9 solution, so the normal saline type level, or the 3.3 hypertonic solution and it comes in little vials um so especially like you know no gatorade um so especially if you're working out that's before, not good electrolytes <laughs> especially with the, the the colors all the blues and the oranges okay. so but um yeah you you can take little shots of those and that's a fast way to uh, uh give yourself more of the electrolytes as well though too so i usually carry some of those around with me too, but you find like people who are in the midst of a, um, cause also when you've got a uh, high stress, your kidneys respond to the low sodium. Um, so if you want to, that's why they'll sprinkle a little bit of Celtic sea salt in water. And if you're right. sipping that, it helps to replenish your, your cortisol balancing system. Um, taking this actually helps. So if you're also in the midst of having an allergic reaction, not talking like an anaphylactic type reaction, but hay fever or sneezing, runny nose, if you start taking some of these little shots, kind of clears you up. Really? Okay. Well, I'm going to, uh, well, that's, that's another great <laughs> one to add to this. I have a, I have a whole page of notes here. Um, 
So that's, uh, and with that one, you also got me thinking too. Um, so um, I exercise a lot. <laughs> I do a lot of very intense uh, exercise. And, um, and I know that, you know, um, it's our amino acid depletion that, uh, that tends to happen prior yeah. to anything else. So, uh, so I will oftentimes sip on a uh, amino acid complex while I'm mm -hmm. exercising, while I'm doing an intense training session of some kind. Mm -hmm. um, and what you have me thinking with this is, uh, is maybe that's something that I should be adding uh, in addition to my amino acid complex. And I would actually uh, throw out there though too, because I know you said you're using it when you're working out. Correct. I, I would either do it like may switch the timing of that to do it after or do it right before you go to bed, because when you're repairing is when you want to utilize. And it's not necessarily while you're in the midst of working out that you're getting the best utilization. OK, so so doing a lot more of that after as well, after or before you go to bed, because that's your repair time. Yeah. OK, well, that, and that makes perfect yeah. sense. Yeah, especially in the window between is it 11 and 1 for growth hormone release is a natural, its own little circadian rhythm that its best time frame. So people yeah. who are going to bed late are missing that window of repair. Oh, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Another reason why everybody should go to bed at 8 o'clock like I do. Especially <laughs> <No. laughs> children. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yes. Well, um, okay. So, uh, so we, we, we've covered a, a lot of ground here. Um, and, uh, and before we, uh, before we go, uh, and, uh, and leave this call, is there anything else that you wanted to mention? <laughs> no, I mean, I think we covered so much. I mean, and there, you know, can be so much more as far as little little things that weren't talked about, more supplements, more machines, more tracking. It's, yeah. you know, this is not ending. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, conversations like this could go on for days. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, um, but awesome. Well, uh, well, Lori, uh, I wanted to thank you so much for your time um, and coming on and talking uh, and talking a well, little overall health with me, uh, you know, not just HRV, uh, not just biofeedback, but overall health and especially uh, dialing into some of these supplements here. Uh, that was, uh, that was some great information that now I have to go look up a bunch of this stuff. Um, so I'm very excited to do that. Um, and I'm sure all of our listeners are very grateful for your time as well. Um, so, uh, so thank you so much. Um, and I'm very excited to see where these conversations go and, uh, and when I see you next week, I'm going to pick your brain a little bit more. And then I might say, let's have you back on and talk about nice. that. I would love to. Thank <laughs> you so much. Yes. Well, excellent. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say goodbye for now. Take care. Oh, oh I'm just sad. Oh. All right. That's good. Sorry, Lori, I'm trying to figure out how to... I was going to say, we didn't get into the peptides. <laughs> we missed a lot. <laughs> uh, I'm so sorry. There we go. Stop recording. <laughs>